We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, good morning. As Bevan said, my name is Ethan. I'm the family pastor here. And we are in the series called Extraordinary. So we're looking at how God uses, God uses ordinary people to make an extraordinary impact in the world. We're looking today, we're going to look at uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, as you may know, this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. It's the second of his two letters, hence 2 Corinthians. So we're going to be looking at that book today. Before we jump in to that one, we're going to look real quickly at something from 1 Corinthians, because it's here where Paul just makes it very clear that the group of people he's writing to when he's writing to that church is a very ordinary group of people. So in 1 Corinthians 1.26, this is what he says. He says, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, and not many were noble of birth, were of noble birth. So in other words, what he's saying here is that this is a very unimpressive group. This is not an extraordinary group. They're not even really particularly well qualified in anything. And then among their non-qualifications that he lists out here, one of the things that he lists is not many of you were influential. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about influence and extraordinary influence. When we think of those who have extraordinary influence, you know, if you just kind of call some names to mind in our culture who has extraordinary influence, we probably think of you know, maybe celebrities, politicians, there might be some CEOs who kind of make the list and they come to mind. And then also in recent years, we've come to associate this term influencer with, with what? With people on social media who can influence the buying habits basically of a large audience online. So these are the things, this is what the world considers to be extraordinary influence. And honestly, when someone has 10 million followers on Instagram, it's kind of tough to argue with that. That seems pretty extraordinary, especially when you consider that pretty much everything that I've posted on social media gets likes from my mom, for one, which I'm not ungrateful for that. Um, my sister, not even both my sisters, just one of my sisters, <laughs> and then my aunts. So fortunately, I have a lot of aunts. That really helps pad my stats. So the world, the world has their version of extraordinary influence. But then, as we look at the Bible, as we look in the Bible, we see that God is not silent on this topic of influence by any means. The Bible actually speaks a lot about influence. It speaks of the benefits of influence. It speaks of um, how to grow, how to increase in influence. And then another thing that emerges as we look at the Bible on this topic is that God's version of extraordinary influence influence is very different from the world's version of extraordinary influence. God's version is typically very unimpressive. It doesn't really stand out, especially if you measure it by worldly standards. And so that leaves us to decide, as followers of Christ, it leaves us to decide, do we pursue an influence that may appear very impressive and effective from the world's perspective, but is really of very little value when it comes to God? Or do we pursue what God says is extraordinary influence, even if the world really looks down on that? To pursue God's version of extraordinary influence, there are two things that we really need to pay attention to. We need to pay attention to the what and to the how. That is, we need to pay attention to the what and the how of influence. What God says we should influence others to do is very different from what the world says that we should influence others to do. And then similarly, how God says that we should go about doing that, as we look at the Bible, is very different from how the world says that we should go about it and how the world does go about it. So when it comes to the what, what you should influence others to do, the culture's basic stance is dealer's choice. It's your call. That's, that's really you decide. And so there are a few things that are considered off-limits, but for the most part, it's really up to you. And if, if you were to thumb through, if you were to pull out the top self-help books from the past 
several decades, you would really find mountains and mountains of advice, some of it good advice, on how to influence others. And one of the earliest of these books was um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. This is by Dale Carnegie, 1936. So this one's been around for a long time. And if you read it, which probably many of you have, you'll find a lot of advice on how to influence others. The book is very true to its title. It tells you how to influence others. But what you will find conspicuously absent from this title and from many other titles in the genre over the past 80 years is really any mention of what you should influence others to do. And that's because the world has no consistent, agreed-upon standard of what the outcome of your influence should be. And so self-help books, basically what that puts them in the position, what they do is they just assume that you've got a goal, you've got a dream, and if you have it, then it must be valid. And honestly, for them to say otherwise would probably decrease book sales. So that's probably not going to change anytime soon. But God's word is not so open-ended when it comes to what we should influence others to do. And there are a lot of different ways that you could boil down the, the what of what God wants us to influence others to do. You could boil that down in some different ways. But the way that we've agreed at this church to phrase it is this. This is our mission. Our mission is thoughtfully inviting broken people to experience transformation in Christ. So we want to team together to influence people to do something very specific, and that is experience transformation in Christ. And transformation, this is something that we're all in need of. We're all in need of transformation because we're all broken people. And what I mean by that is sin has had a devastating impact on all of our lives. It has broken our relationship with God, it has broken our relationships with each other. It's had a devastating impact on our lives, and there's nothing on our own that we can do to put those broken pieces of our life back together. The other day, I was, uh, I was in my living room, and I heard a crash from the kitchen. And so I ran into the kitchen, and I looked, and there was just there was glass everywhere on the floor of our kitchen, Standing over there uh, on the other side was my daughter, Margaret, who's two, and she was barefoot. And my wife was in the kitchen, too. Fortunately, Margaret, her response was to just kind of freeze. I think my wife and I scared her with our reaction, so she just kind of froze. Um, so she froze, so I, like, tiptoed through the glass. I scooped her up. I put her on the counter. And it turns out what had happened was just kind of a fluke thing where my wife was in there. She was getting a lid, or she was getting a pot out from like down low, and a lid to one of our pots. It just slipped out, and it fell maybe 10 inches, but when it did, it shattered. And it shattered not into hundreds of pieces. It shattered into literally just thousands of pieces. And so this is similar to the effect that sin has on our lives. Sin, it's not like, not like a nick on your windshield of your car where you know, if you, act, if you act fast, you can go get it repaired before it spreads and before it causes more damage. Sin isn't like that. Repairing our broken lives, it would be like my wife and I trying to get down there on the kitchen floor and grab up all those thousands of little pieces. Some of them, you know, you need a magnifying glass to even see. Grab all those little pieces and put them back together and repair that lid. That's, that's just not going to happen. That was a one-way trip and that's something that can't be undone. And no amount of glue, no amount of attention to detail is ever going to put that back together. But then God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus so that he could restore our relationship with him. He could restore our relationship to God and put the broken pieces of our lives back together. That which we were totally unable to do, that's what God, came, that's what God sent Jesus to do in our lives. And so if you're a follower of Christ, then you've experienced this. You've experienced this transformation, and you are continuing to experience his transforming work in your life. And this transformation in the lives of others, that is the outcome of influence that God considers to be extraordinary influence. And so what we influence people to do is very different from what the world influences people to do. Also, how we go about influencing them is very different. Different. And that's because while extraordinary or ordinary influence requires just ordinary power, God's version of extraordinary influence, that requires an extraordinary power. So if I want to just influence you to, say, buy one product versus another, 
okay, that's something that might be within my power. I could probably have that power of influence in your life. And if not, I could probably read how to win friends and influence people, and then maybe I would have that power after I applied some of those techniques. Um, So that's within my power. But if I want to influence you instead to put your trust in Jesus and to invite him to transform your life, experience his transformation, well, that's a different matter altogether. And that is beyond my power. And so for extraordinary influence, a different approach is needed. And specifically, the approach that's needed is an approach that relies on God's power, not on my ordinary power. And so Paul here in this passage we're going to look at today, he sets a great example for us of this approach. And so to learn from his example, we're going to look at three choices that he made, three specific choices he made when it came to influencing the church in Corinth. The first of those choices is that he chose faith over force. So in chapter 1, we see that Paul chose faith influence over force influence. And in his previous letter, Paul, he had confronted the church on some sin. And then at the end of that previous letter, he had told them that he was going to come, he was planning to come back and check up on their progress. But now, in 2 Corinthians, he's writing to them and he's explaining why he's changed his plans. And here's what we read. I call on God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith that you stand firm. So this is very interesting. This is very interesting. Apparently, Paul thought that he he could have a greater influence by not coming than by coming. So Paul knew that he had weight and he had power behind his name. And it would have been very easy for him to show up and, as he said here, to lord it over their faith. His coming, it would have brought pressure. It would have brought intimidation and maybe authority. And it probably would have brought consequences as well. And so that's what he wanted to spare them, as he says. He knew that he could easily come and influence their behavior. But instead of coming, Paul did a counterintuitive thing. He stayed away. He stayed away. He didn't come and pressure them. He didn't come and intimidate them. He didn't come and shame them or embarrass them. And that's because Paul recognized that transformation occurs not as pressure is applied and behavior is altered, but it occurs as faith is built up and as hearts are changed. Faith, not pressure, is the only suitable foundation for real lasting change. And so that's why Paul said it is by faith that you stand firm. So if pressure is the foundation of my change, then I will not stand firm. If you are pressuring me to do something and I change, and that's the foundation of my change, I'm not going to stand firm. As soon as I can escape that pressure, as soon as I can get out from under it, then I'm going to go back to doing whatever I was doing before. And so... Yeah, and so if you want to help me change, if you want to help me change, then instead of pressuring me, you need to help think, how can you build up my faith? How can you help me shift my trust? My trust is in something. How can you help me shift my trust and my faith from what it was in to being in God? That's how you can actually help me change. That's how you can help me transform. And this is what Paul did. He chose to have this faith level influence rather than a force level influence. Now force, force is all about applying leverage in order to get certain results. That's what force is. And so when we use force to get results in our relationships or in people's lives, it's kind of like pulling out this big old relational crowbar. And the problem then with these relational crowbars that we use is that you're never going to have enough leverage in anyone's life to be able to change their heart. A relational crowbar can't change someone's heart. No amount of guilt trips that you can apply, no amount of social pressure or leverage, no amount of you owe me's or anything along those lines can ever change a heart. Faith is something that can't be influenced by force. And if you think about it, it's actually an absurd idea to think that you could force someone 
that I could force you to believe in God's word, or I could manipulate you to trust in God in a new area of your life. That's just not how it works. But often, we want to see change in people's lives, and, and that's a good thing. It's good if we want to see change in people's lives, but then we pull out the wrong tool for the job. And the other day, I got a new phone. It was shipped to me. It came in the mail. I opened it up, and I needed to transfer the SIM card from my old phone into my new phone. So I, I got the old SIM card out. That was easy enough. And then I was trying to figure out how to like, open it up the new phone so I could get the SIM card in there. And so I went to the junk drawer, and I started pulling out all these like random tools. <laughs> and I, I tried all these different ways of forcing this SIM card area thing open. And, and I was in the middle of doing that, and I thought, I am about to destroy this phone before I even get a chance to use it. And I thought, there has got to be a better way to do this. And so I went to the owner's manual, and it turns out that, yes, there was absolutely a better way to do this. They included a little tool. I used the tool the way they said, and it was fine. I didn't have to force it open, it turned out. This is similar to what we do in people's lives. If we love someone, we want to see God transform their life. That's a good thing. But we risk doing real damage in our relationships and in their life when we reach for those wrong tools like guilt, pressure, or shame, those tools that actually come very naturally to us. But then if these are the wrong tools, if that's not the right tool, then what is the right tool to help build someone's faith? If you want to have a faith-level impact, faith-level influence in someone's life, your best bet is to actually follow Paul's example in this passage and work with them for their joy. Work with that person for their joy. Now, the word with here in this passage, it stands in contrast to the word over that we had just read. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. When people sense that you view yourself as over them, then they're going to resist your influence in their life. But when people sense that you are with them, they're much more likely to seek out your influence in their life. And so if you want to have a voice in someone's life, find ways to work with them for their joy. You can do that by genuinely looking for ways where you can be helpful in practical ways. Find obstacles that are blocking that person's joy and then work with them to help remove those obstacles. And when someone knows that you are working with them for their joy, it turns out that you have much more credibility in all areas of their life or in additional other areas, not just the, way, the one where you're working for their joy. And so, so next time you catch yourself pulling out that relational crowbar to practice influence over somebody, instead stop and ask, how can I work with them instead for their joy? So that's the first choice that Paul made. Here's the second one. The second one is to choose sadness over anger. So we see Paul made this choice in 2 Corinthians 2.4, where he writes this. He says, For I wrote to you, speaking about his previous letter, I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. So it would have been very easy for the church in Corinth to get the idea from Paul's previous letter that he was angry with them. And so what Paul's doing here is he's setting the record straight. He wants them to know, I wasn't, I wasn't fuming when I wrote you earlier. I was actually crying. And so why does he want them to know this? It's because anger and sadness, these are emotional indicators that let you and others know whether you're working with them for their joy or you're lording it over them, basically for your own joy. Anger, anger is essentially a self-focused response. And so when I'm angry towards someone because of their sin, or maybe I'm angry with them because of their, their lack of change in a certain area of their life, what I'm doing is I'm viewing their sin through the lens of the impact that it has on me, right? And then sadness occurs, sadness occurs when I take that spotlight off of myself and I begin to view their sin, or I begin to view their lack of change, not through the lens of how it impacts me or is inconvenient for me, but through the lens of how it impacts them and the negative impact, the negative effect and the consequences 
that it has on them. Now imagine here in this letter with Paul, if Paul had viewed their sin through the lens of how it impacted him. Instead, he might have written something like, I, just, I can't believe that you would do this. I spent all this time teaching you, serving you, suffering, working myself half to death, losing sleep, basically pouring myself out for you. And what thanks do I get? But that's not the letter that he wrote. He didn't view his sin through the lens of how it impacted him, himself. He viewed it through the lens of how it impacted them. And the result is that instead of anger, and you can just hear grief as he writes things like great distress, anguish of heart, with many tears. We face this same choice between anger and sadness all the time, on a daily basis, multiple times a day, in, in most cases, I would say. Uh, for myself, here are three ways that I encounter it. Just real quick, uh, by way of example. So one, one of my kids lies to me. Okay, they lied to me. Am I mad because they disrespected me or because of the challenge that that lie, the inconvenience of that lie that it produced in our family? Or am I grieved because the sin that lives in my own heart, I also see that living in the heart of my child? Two, neighbors, 2 a.m., they're fighting, it's loud, and let's just say that it's summer, so the windows have to be open also. Am I mad because it's 2 a.m. and I just want to be asleep? Or am I grieved because I know that these neighbors don't know Jesus. I know that they don't have a relationship with him. Three, a friend makes a dumb decision. Am I mad because we disagree? Or am I grieved because I can look out, I can see the long-term consequence that this decision is likely to have in his life? Am I mad or am I grieved? In each of these, I can choose my response. But then what difference does this make when it comes to influence? Because that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about influence. What difference does this make for influence? Well, consider this. Picture that someone is sharing something with you that's difficult to hear. And just like Paul is doing, that's what he's doing. He's sharing something difficult, and he had shared in his previous letter some things that were difficult for the church to hear. So picture someone's doing that with you. Now picture that that person, as they're doing that, anger is just written all over their face. It's in their body language. It's in their voice. You can just hear it. How receptive are you to what they're telling you? And how convinced are you that they love you and that they're speaking out of a motive of love for you? And now, okay, picture that same conversation, same content and everything like that, but instead of anger on their face and in their voice, picture grief. Whether there's actual tears or not, that's really irrelevant. Some people are criers and some people aren't, and that's okay. And it's actually beside the point of this passage. But in that scenario where grief is just written on their face, how receptive are you now to what they're telling you? And how convinced are you of their love for you? When you become angry with someone over their sin or over their lack of change, you're clearly communicating with them. This is more about me than it is about you. And when that happens, we all know what happens. It raises their defenses, and you've just become the last person who's going to be a help to them and help them change. So until we care more and care enough to grieve over someone, um, how, how someone's sin is hurting them and how it's hurting their future than how it is hurting us and how it impacts us, we're not going to really have any voice of influence in their life. And so next time you find yourself angry at someone, let that be a trigger to stop and ask God to give you compassion for that person and to choose sadness over anger. The final choice that we see here with Paul is the choice to choose forgiveness over bitterness. Forgiveness over bitterness. So in 1 Corinthians, again, Paul, he had confronted a man involved in sexual sin at that church. And the man, he repents, and now in the second letter to this church, Paul points out why it's so important that everybody forgive this man. So here's what he says. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So 
Just look at the emphasis on forgiveness here. We read, forgive, forgive, forgiven, forgive, forgiven. Paul wants them to forgive the man who sinned. He wants them to know that he forgives the man who sinned. Basically, he wants everybody involved in this situation to forgive, to choose forgiveness. And if you and I, if we want to have anything close to resembling an extraordinary influence, then forgiveness, that's essential for us as well. And what's the reason for that? The reason is our mission. Our mission is thoughtfully inviting broken people to experience transformation in Christ. If our mission involves something other than people, then perhaps there wouldn't be a need for forgiveness. But where people and relationships are involved, hurt is inevitable. And where hurt exists, there's, all, there's always going to be a need for forgiveness. And where there's a need for forgiveness, there's an opportunity for unforgiveness, which means there's an opportunity for bitterness to grow up as well. Now, a while ago, my wife and I, we, we thought it would be cool to be able to look out our window and see like, wild birds and birds, just basically have birds out on our patio. We thought that would be cool. We thought our kids would like it. We thought we'd like it. And so uh, we went out and we bought several bird feeders. We put them up. And one thing that we quickly learned is that if you place a bird feeder somewhere, you need to go ahead and not be surprised when there is a huge bird seed mess underneath the area where you've placed the bird feeder. If I placed a bird feeder here, there would be a ton of bird seed right down there. So you need to not be surprised when that happens. And then because what's falling to the ground is seed that has potential you know, for life and growth, then you need to also not be surprised when unwanted grasses grow up in that area there. And then, furthermore, you need to also not be surprised when those unwanted grasses try to take over your entire patio. So when it comes to patio birds, those are just some things that you need to know. Um, and you really have three options when it comes to patio birds. Option one is you just don't set up a feeder. You don't set up a feeder, you attract no birds except those that come just on their own will and volition, but you have a clean patio, so that's a plus. Option number two is, yeah, you go ahead and set up a feeder, you attract a lot of birds, but then you just basically allow the seed to do its thing and take over your patio. Option number three is you set up the feeder, you attract a lot of birds, but then you do regular cleanup to get the seeds up, keep them from growing. And then when they do grow, because they're small and they're sneaky, and so you can't get all of them, when they do grow, you just get down and you pluck them up by the root or you, you know, spray Roundup or something like that. So when it comes to patio birds, those are your options. When it comes to influence and forgiveness, we basically have the same three options available to us. Option number one is to minimize your relationships. You can try to avoid hurt and the need for forgiveness, by avoiding people and avoiding relationships. And this may reduce the overall amount of hurt that you experience in life, but it will also prevent you from being used by God to influence others. Option number two is you go ahead and yes, you, you engage in relationships, but then when the inevitable hurt comes along, you refuse to deal with it. You, you ignore it. And the result is that the seeds of hurt, they fall and they begin to grow into unforgiveness. It's in the DNA of hurt to grow into unforgiveness. And so left alone, unforgiveness, it will grow deep roots, and it's going to turn into bitterness. And bitterness is capable of destroying both your life and your influence. Bitterness is a very serious thing. Option number three is go ahead and engage in relationships, but don't be surprised when hurt comes along. It will come along. And when it does, do the maintenance work to forgive. Do the maintenance work to forgive, and when you identify a hurt, just go ahead and forgive it. When you realize that a particular hurt has, has fallen to the ground, is beginning to grow roots of bitterness, don't panic. Forgive. Roll up your sleeves, get down, and pull that up by the roots by forgiving again and again and again. So forgiveness is one of those things, though, that is much easier to stand up here and talk about than it is to actually do. And one of the reasons for that is that it is actually a key strategy of the enemy to undermine the work of God, which is the whole reason that Paul is writing about this in the first place. Let's go back and look at what he actually said. He said, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So Satan is the enemy of everything that God wants to accomplish. If it pleases God, if it honors God, 
if it glorifies God, then Satan opposes it. He opposes everything that God wants to accomplish in this world, in this city, in this church, in your family, and in your life. He opposes it. And so forgiveness, it may be difficult, but this passage clearly shows us that neglecting forgiveness is a surefire way that we play into the enemy's hands. And we may not think, you know, I want to support Satan in undermining the work of God, so I'm going to choose unforgiveness. We, we're not going to think that. But when we persist in unforgiveness, that is exactly what we're doing. And if you were unaware of that, that's okay. But I am telling you right now, from the word of God, the enemy wants to use unforgiveness to outwit you. And so, let us not be unaware of his schemes. Instead, let us forgive. Now, God wants people around us to experience transformation in Christ. This is amazing. It's amazing that he graciously wants to include us in that process. And so, as we move out into our week, we have a potential to have an extraordinary impact, an extraordinary influence on each other as we interact and on others that we interact with. But we must remember to set aside those relational crowbars and instead work with people for their joy. We must allow sadness over people's sin to win out over anger over people's sin. And we must forgive. We must refuse to allow bitterness to undermine the work of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you graciously do include us in what you are doing. You could just snap your fingers and you could bring about any change that you want. Uh, you have unlimited influence and power and yet you decide to include us. You loop us into this process and really um, you allow us the joy of, of working with you. So we, we thank you for that, God. Um, it's it's an honor to be included in that. And God, we just ask that as we go out, as we go out into our week, that you would help us to interact with people, not in a selfish way, but in a way that really reflects the compassion that you have shown for us, God. And God, we pray that you would use us as a church, that you would continue to transform us, and, and that you would use us to help bring about transformation in the lives of those that we come to contact with. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.